most people think reptiles are cold-blooded animals. That's not exactly the correct terms and might cause us confusion, but let's just say it is for a second. Point being, they need to get heat from the environment. So, rationally speaking, a reptile living in the Arctic is almost impossible, isn't it? Well, that's not entirely correct. Reptiles do exist in the Arctic. One of them is a lizard, the viviparous lizard. In fact, this is the only known extant lizard that lives in the Arctic Circle. So, let me bring up the question. What exactly is viviparous lizard? Viviparous lizard is not a generic group. It is a species, one specific species. Traditionally, they are assigned the name Lacerta vivipara, which literally means viviparous lizard, if that's not obvious enough. Taxonomically speaking, or to be precise, in terms of scientific nomenclature, viviparous lizard was confusing. The first known usage of Lacerta vivipara was done by Von Jacquin in 1787, but it was not done as assigning a name to a newly described species. Rather, he described the fact that he observed the lizard being viviparous, not oviparous like many lizards. The next earlier usage was by Liechtenstein in 1823. This one is considered to be the first time this lizard was assigned this name. Hence, this one is used for the authorship. However, prior to this year, the animal itself was collected among the specimens assigned to different species, like Lacerta agilis, Lacerta viridis, Podarchis muralis, and many more. I would just be wasting time if I list every single name it had. This, of course, made it confusing taxonomically speaking. And then, later in 1830, Wagler published his own systematic concept and nomenclature for European lizards, and he assigned Lacerta vivipara to a new genus, Zootoka. Of course, by that time, this is just, you know, yet another publication, quote unquote. So some people did use that nomenclature, yet some ignored it, or simply didn't even know the publication exists. That was until the 1990s when Mayer and Bischoff published a revision for the Lacerta genus. Many herpetologists started using the name Zootoka vivipara. Still, not everyone though. I've still seen Lacerta vivipara being used in some publication. To be fair, Mayer and Bischoff's publication was in German. Aside from the fact that not everyone will agree to the argument, not everyone can read and understand it. So yeah, they are classified in the Lacertidae family, which is the typical lizard you could say. Oh by the way, they are called viviparous lizard because, of course, they are viviparous. I'll talk about this later in the lifestyle and behavior section. Like I said earlier, viviparous lizard can be found in the Arctic, to be precise, across northern Europe and Asia. That's why they are also called common lizards, because they are quite common for those who describe them, because they are Europeans. If you are not within their distribution range, then of course they are not common. Oh, by the way, in case you are confused and wondering, yes, this is within the Arctic Circle. They don't live in the actual Arctic polar like the polar bear. So yeah. Next, let's talk about their morphology. To be honest, there's not much interesting thing about their morphology. They are relatively small, around 15 to 20 centimeters long. Almost half of that is their tail. They have five digits on both of their front and hind limbs, each equipped with claws. Their legs are not exceptionally short, but not long either. Their snout is relatively blunt. Their dorsal scales are mostly small and granular, while their ventral scales are rectangular. They have some interspecific varieties. Some have brownish color, some can be reddish, greenish, and even blackish. Some are melanistic, in which they are, well, black, like other melanistic animals. Their ventral coloration is typically brighter and varied a lot, especially in females. It can be whitish, yellowish, or it can be darker, but typically still brighter than their dorsal side. Females typically have stripes, while males typically have spots. Emphasis on typically, because sometimes that's not the case. Even though they have a relatively high degree of morphological variation, this variation is not indicative of their subspecies. The same subspecies can have varying coloration, and two subspecies can have similar coloration. So yeah, 
Right now, it's almost impossible to tell their subspecies apart by relying on morphology. Subspecies are generally determined by molecular analysis, karyotyping, behavior, and to some extent, distribution. To be fair, I personally think there is not enough detailed morphological analysis of this species yet. So who knows, we might actually be able to have a morphological diagnostic character for their subspecies. Next, let's talk about their lifestyle and behavior. But before that, Viviparous lizards are terrestrial, meaning they are mostly on the ground. They are opportunistic carnivore, meaning they will eat whatever prey is small enough for them, such as arthropods, worms, etc. They are active forager, meaning they actively hunt for prey, not an ambush predator. What's interesting about the viviparous lizard is, not only are they viviparous, but they are also oviparous. If we're talking on the species level, that is. By that I mean, some individuals can be viviparous, while some can be oviparous. Oviparity is the ancestral trait for lizard, so they lost oviparity and evolved viviparity. Well, that's the usual case, but in the case of viviparous lizards, some are still oviparous. How could that be? Well, a 2018 publication tackled that topic. First, let's look at their population. The red ones are oviparous while the blue ones are viviparous, so you could see that they are divided into multiple groups. Based on this fact and their karyotypes, there are generally six groups. Western viviparous, Eastern viviparous, Western oviparous, Central viviparous 2, Central viviparous 1, Romanian viviparous, and Eastern oviparous. Now, based on the phylogenetic analysis, Eastern oviparous is the outgroup. Which should be quite obvious, of course, because they are oviparous among the viviparous lizards after all. But the western oviparous are positioned within the viviparous group. Now that's more interesting. The most likely answer for now is they re evolved oviparity. So basically, if you look at the map again, this one has not evolved viviparity, while the rest evolved viviparity. And then this one re evolved oviparity. Why though? Well, it's not exactly discussed in the publication, but we could use our logic by looking at other lizards. Being gravid is hard for your life. I mean, you are carrying an entire living being which is constantly taking away your resources, which you also need to survive of course. And then, it adds more weight to you. It's harder to move while you are gravid. I mean, I can say for myself because I've never been pregnant, I'm a male after all, but I imagine so, which is why being gravid is difficult for your life. That's why it can be more beneficial for them to just lay their egg and call it a day. Now, the question is, so why did they evolve viviparity in the first place? Well, that's because it's too cold for eggs in the north. As you can see here, the viviparous one live on the northern side, while the oviparous ones live on the southern edge. Generally speaking, the closer you are to the pole, the colder it will be. That's why they need to be viviparous, so that they can still proliferate. If they lay eggs, most of the eggs won't hatch. Not enough heat. A simple logic, but I have to remind you that it's just a theory, and it comes from me who is not doing research on this species. So yeah, take it with a grain of salt. Oh, by the way, these lizards with different reproductive mode does not reproduce with each other. But there was an experiment done to crossbreed them, and the result was an egg with incompletely calcified eggshell. Anyway, they have an internal fertilization. Usually, males will grip the females with their mouth and then proceed to mate. Unfortunately, I couldn't find any Creative Commons image of this, but you can find some images if you Google viviparous lizard mating. This usually happens around April and May. Females usually produce 3 to 10 offsprings, which they will give birth to around July. In the case of a viperous one, it depends on how cold the environment is. The colder it is, the less clutch will be formed. They also retain their eggs in their oviduct for a longer period. Oh, I did say females can have more color variation earlier, right? This variation is actually relevant for their reproduction. Typically, there are three types. orange 
yellow, and mixed. Orange females typically have larger body with low clutch size. This one is more likely to survive and reproduce because of their fitness. Yellow females have smaller body but have a large clot size, meaning many offsprings. Their sheer number makes them persist and survive. Basically, orange thrive by quality, yellow thrive by quantity, while mixed are, well, mixed, just average, you know, balanced and not specialized. Since they live in the Arctic Circle which can reach below 0 degrees Celsius, they definitely need a special way to survive. They are still ectothermic after all, meaning they need environmental heat for their metabolism. We did talk about their reproduction, which shows one adaptation of living in a cold habitat. Aside from their reproduction mode, they have another exceptional adaptation. Not only do they have higher freeze tolerance, they are able to enter the supercooled state. So, if you didn't know already, the reason why freezing is lethal for organisms is mostly because, well, their cells also freeze. Ice crystals are formed, physiological process halts, and cells break. And then, you're, well, you're, you're dead. In the case of viviparous lizards, they accumulate glucose on their cytoplasm towards winter. This way, even though they are frozen on the outside, they are not on the inside, at least not on the cellular level. So, they could maintain their cellular activity. And yes, they will usually stay in their burrow, frozen on the outside, while waiting for spring when they will be thawed again. They can live for 5 to 6 years, so they experience this period several times throughout their life. That is the life of viviparous lizards. Even though they are a relatively common lizard throughout Europe, there is still many more to discover about them. Who knows, maybe there will be a taxonomic discovery soon enough. Maybe another interesting fact that we didn't think of. But for now, let's just learn what is known. And that's all for now. Oh, by the way, while viviparous lizard is considered the only extant lizard living in the Arctic Circle, it's technically not the only herpetofauna. Leatherback sea turtle can reach the Arctic Circle, and some frogs do too. Anyway, enjoy your day.